Hello and welcome to Access Chat. Delighted to have Shanti Flynn with us today. Shanti is the Chief HR Officer for ADECO Group, which is a multinational people and resourcing provider um, and also uh, partner for the Olympics and Paralympics. I had the pleasure of meeting you first in uh, Rio last year for the Inclusion Summit and it was really great to hear you speak then. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be interested in the topic of disability inclusion? Uh, thank you, Neil. It's a great pleasure to um, to be able to talk to you you guys again. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, I was brought up, my, my brother has a, a severe form of epilepsy, my older brother, and, um, uh, and through be, having experienced firsthand of that type of disability, and perhaps, you know, he's in his uh, 60s now, through um, you know a time and a period where um, epilepsy was treated as a as a mental disorder and therefore in, as an illness as opposed to you know something that would constrain you in everyday life. So in every other way, um, he was just like the rest of us, but um, because of his medication, he had to live a much more restricted life. So I think that was my first, um, and he is now wheelchair bound. Um, uh, and that was really part of, you know, watching how he had to, how he became marginalised, if you like, in society, how his formal education was halted really early, made me realise how easy it is to exclude people um, from uh, from society, but also from just being able to manage themselves in day-to-day -day life. So and that was my first um, kind of wake-up call, if you like. But then... In, in sort of more recent years, my um, my brother-in-law, who's my the, 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 he unfortunately has passed away, but he was quadriplegic, so he was injured in a rugby accident. So um, we had a, a, a number of experiences where we went on holidays and had to experience again the kinds of restrictions. And he's he was incredibly smart, um, very very smart, learned different languages, and and very very competent. Um, in lots of ways and managed his life as independently as you could with with the fact that he had a very very severe disability um he was in fact that we i mentioned it in in um in my talk earlier neil but um we managed to get him down the steps of the um pyramid of uh, the um in into the tomb of tutankhamun Moon with the guide and my husband carrying him in his wheelchair down I think he was the first person in a wheelchair to get into the tomb so uh, so I think it's how do you overcome barriers yeah. um, that sometimes can feel insurmountable so that's my the reason why I feel passionately about the subject okay and um, uh, we, we, we I know that that, that Deborah also has uh, a daughter with Down syndrome, and um, they've also been to Egypt. And as one of, I think Deborah's profile picture on on Twitter has a picture of her um, and and her her daughter Sarah riding a camel. Um, <laughs> so uh, Deborah's unfortunately unable to join us for technical reasons this afternoon. If people are wondering, so uh, we're we're very sorry about that. Um, so. Bringing back to the sort of global scenario, there's you know, huge numbers of people with disabilities in the world. Um, you know, according to the World Health Organization, I think it's one, one billion, which is depending on what you believe the population numbers to be, 15 to 20 percent. But how do we further the sort of topic of inclusion in, in, in the working environment? Obviously, as a provider of, of people and talent, this is an area where a DECO group can obviously make a difference. Yeah, I think there's a number of different ways. I mean, at the, at the very basic level, you raise awareness um, to, 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 to show that including people with multiple differences, and obviously the whole topic of disability is, is massively broad in itself. You know, there are such a wide range of different types of of disability, and I, I learned this phrase, which I actually like, when I was um, uh, working in Asia, and in India they called uh, people with disabilities they called them differently abled, and um, that stuck with me. I, I prefer that, which is 
you know, if you, instead of focusing on, on what people can't do, you focus on what they can. Um, so I think that that whole idea that we all bring with us a whole range of things that we're not really able to do. You know, I, I have areas of incompetence. Um, we all have areas of incompetence that are barriers to us doing different types of work. Um, and I think that's why I, I think changing the conversation around how do we focus on competence and what people can do and how do they leverage what they can do and then if there are specific gaps um, that we need to bridge somehow, then how do we do that? So it just turns the conversation differently. And I think awareness raising around inclusion, and I've just got one story that you know is a little bit old, but um, when I was at Ford Motor Company, um, we, we had an intern um, who had cerebral, se severe cerebral palsy, couldn't write, um, and was using a keyboard with a knitting needle. And um, uh, what was really fascinating is, is just the presence of him in his working environment was enough to change the dynamic of the team and the people around him. They could see what he could do, and they started to support him in a way that was unexpected. So I think when you see it, you know, see inclusion in its real sense, which is someone who is differently abled operating in a in a in a regular working environment with different types of individuals and, and they they support each other, you see how inclusion really works. Um, so I think companies can do different things. They can simply hire people um, and uh, make sure that, that, that those kinds of um, uh, issues for that individual can disappear. Um, or they can raise awareness and they can do these as well. Um, and you can you can make sure that the individuals that you hire they can also talk about what it is that they're overcoming and that can in itself be powerful. So I think that a lot of workplaces are becoming more progressive and individuals are becoming more sensitized to people with different different abilities. Um, and I think allowing that conversation to happen in a, in a kind of safe environment is also important. No, so, uh... Considering that you know, when we have uh, diverse uh, workplaces and, and it's also something that helps companies at the level of understanding society and uh, what's around them, also uh, it's, it's a way uh, to allow more creativity w within the workplace and, and allow us all to make met better decisions. But uh, what do you think is also the role of uh, leadership in change management in order to, to open that reality a at work? You know, I think the, the, um, the change management piece, you know, is, is important. And, you know, tone at the top, you know, how do you, how do you configure your workplaces? How do you encourage remote working where it, where, and flexibility where that's possible? Um, I think all of these different areas are things that um, can be done. Um, and the interesting thing is that often different kinds of organizations might put what I'd call sort of, you know, um, insignificant barriers where they don't need to be, you know. Um, Absolutely. You know, so they, they're not really real constraints on someone's ability to do a real job. So, you know, I come at this a slightly different way, which is if you, again, if you come at something from a competence perspective and you have, most of us use competency-based interviewing and you focus on those areas, it, it allows you to change the dialogue about what someone is coming to the workplace to do. Do they physically have to come to the workplace and do it? And what are your various alternatives to get the work done? And we all talk about team. So, you know, in change management, part of it is about how do you how do you build teams around different types of capability? So there's no reason why the whole subject of disability can't be factored into the way in which a whole team operates. Um, and that's part of the change management dialogue that I think we should be encouraging more and more, that it's about a team dynamic. And as you say, you generate a different, I mean, you just have to be at the Paralympics to see some of these athletes and the difficulties they overcome, and you would never, 
you would you would never object to one of these individuals on your team. Frankly, you know, you're never going to lose with some of that, you know, energy and passion and drive. So I think I think that's the these are the change management. Exposure is part of it. Okay. Um, it's easy to talk about it. It's harder to do it. Um, so I think exposure, and we did that. We had an inclusion um, conference here in the ADECA group in Switzerland where we invited different work colleagues. I think we had about 150 colleagues where we brought individuals from our Spanish, our Italian business to come and talk about the work of their different foundations. So this was real work that they were doing to include people with disabilities into their workforce and how that was going for them. And this has been being built on over a number of years. I, I think it's always going to be a multi-year effort uh, to, to get this right. I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you on the idea of, of, of working towards people's talents. And, and one of the interesting things we've seen recently, and we've been working with a number of organizations around cognitive disabilities, so uh, areas that are you know, unseen. So with the Paralympians, obviously it's a clear it's clear that someone has a, a disability, um, but often if you have if you're on the autistic spectrum, for example, um, or you're dyslexic, you may have talents, but you may also be a, a serial interview flunker because that really doesn't play to your strengths. So um, one of the things that that uh, is beginning to be looked at is sort of more work placements and finding other ways to bring those skills out because we know that there's an enormous amount of creativity amongst the, the population of neurodiverse people, but it's how do you, you, you really enable them to get that talent across. I, I think that the other thing that I am really interested in covering is that you, you actually have formal programs for it, uh, working with with the Paralympic athletes. So this is this is something that's that's quite special. Can you tell us a little bit more about your your Paralympic program, your athlete career program? Yeah, I mean, I think the um, this has been going on um, since two thousand and seven. We've um, we've had an athlete career program, and this is in partnership with the Olympics and the Paralympics, and um, we have representatives in 40 countries um, who as either as you know dedicated or as part of their roles is working in partnership um, with um, the local committees and the, and the international committees to try and educate athletes to build help them build um, skills for their for them to be able to progress their careers when they either stop being an athlete or when they as interns within organizations so they can get sort of um, a slightly more flexible work because particularly the Paralympic athletes, they generally will have longer athletic careers than the Olympic athletes, which is also an interesting observation. So they don't necessarily want to be in full time work straight away. They want to be able to access work experience. So, you know, we've placed, um, you know, it, it, well, and beyond the, the athletes, we've placed 72,000 people in, you know, between 2004 and 2015 with disabilities in, you know, in our, in our, with, with our partner companies. Um, so, I mean, over a number of years, you build up the, the knowledge of how to work with people with disabilities to allow them to integrate better, to onboard into another company, which companies can, can support that, those programs more effectively. But the fact that it's a living thing within our organization all the time allows us to, 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 to maintain focus on it, because I don't think there are many organizations that have this kind of a, a support network for um, people, for, for athletes, but for athletes with disability. I think that's that's the, um, you know, I think that's something that's relatively um, rare in the workplace. So it's a it's a great uh, program. Um, and in fact, that's how I managed to get to to Rio to to meet you in the first place, Neil. So, yes. um, so I think, you know, more than half of our, our, our countries have got some kind of program that supports people with disabilities. 
um, but with the, the focus on sport, it's actually in some ways a little bit easier to convey a strong message because clearly these these athletes um, have got particular skills that are very obvious. You know, they they operate in teams. They're very driven. They're ambitious. They work really hard. They can overcome barriers. You know, there are all sorts of reasons why you would want to employ someone. From this population so in some ways it's an easier sell not Absolutely. to say that everyone with a disability has to be a paralympic athlete but you know i think it somehow it allows you to to broaden the dialogue um and um and so it's a good way in yeah i i think it's definitely inspiring to 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 see the earth to see the athletes and, and absolutely you know, see what they're capable of. I think, wasn't it the, the 1500 meters where they actually ran a faster time in the Paralympic finals than they did in the Olympic finals. So, so you, know, you sh should not discount these guys as, as being um, second class athletes. These, they, they're, they're fantastic athletes, um, but equally, not everyone can be a Paralympian, and we need to we need to find ways of of valuing all of the the talent that's out there with with disabilities. So, you raised a really interesting point about integrating seventy two thousand people into partner companies. Is there more that can be done here to to enable partners like yourselves to? To pass information, and also, obviously, information is difficult. But, but um, in, in and it's sensitive information. But is there more that we could be doing as um, consumers of personnel services and providers of personnel services in general to actually make it easier for for people with disabilities? So, for example, within our organisation, we have disability passports. So, uh, or sorry. Well, we don't call them disability passports anymore. They're workplace adjustment passports. But, but essentially, these are the things that people need to be able to do their job. Uh, and you don't want to renegotiate these every time you change a manager or change a, a position. W you know, perhaps, would it be a good idea to do something similar across industry? I mean, to be honest with you, I think any good idea that changes the way in which um, you can include different kinds of people is always worth trying, frankly. And I think depending on the nature of the work that the that, that, that different companies have, different methods might be appropriate. So I think that, that idea is a fantastic one. Um, I think the, 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 the good thing is, and this is part of the, 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 the value of the way in which we try to access good practice, as you know, we've got it, within our organization, we have, you know, we have in Japan, we have, a, you know, a, a, a program, it's called Soleil, um, and they operate in terms of, you know, training and equipping people in one way that works in that culture. So I think that's the other thing, that it has to be culturally sensitive. And so sometimes it's easy to say, okay, this idea will really work, we'll globally roll it out. And then you find you bump into a kind of, you know, these, again, invisible barriers, which are cultures, which saying, well, actually, they don't really want to talk about this. We want to talk about this, this in this way. Even as far as, you know, just the language itself around what's acceptable, what's not acceptable in different communities. Um, it's quite a difficult thing to navigate without being, you know, non-PC. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, so I come across the semantics of disability all the time and it's, it's a minefield. I walk in, get my legs you know, blown off because it really, somewhere in the world you're going to upset someone. So, uh, yeah. We, we, you know, for for example, we we have colleagues in France, and they have a mission handicap. Of well, we would course. never, in the UK, talk about handicap anymore, yes. because that's that's sort of very old-fashioned language as far as we're concerned. But that's that's the, the the language and the culture of our colleagues in France, and they do great work around accessibility. So so we have to be mindful of of these cultural differences. And you're right, Japan's very different again. But yeah. they have one thing that I think they're well ahead on, and that is 
um, aging work. Uh, you know, they've got a, a, a super aged population. Yes. And they are engaging the eld elders in the population to stay healthy through working. Yeah. Um, uh, and is that something that Soleil is addressing? Because it's something that we as a glo global population need to address in terms of staying healthy, productive, well, as, as long as possible. Yes, and you know, I mean, I think um, I, I think partly Soleil will be addressing that issue, but I think it goes beyond that. Um, you know, each one of our programs in different countries is is tailoring its its uh, work around the needs of that community, the needs of um, the candidates that come into the workplace. Um, but also, it's about creating a barrier-free environment. So it is about physical barriers, um, you know, and remote working, and and creating the opportunity for. We've got 47 teleworkers in 18 locations in Japan um, that are in contact with us through text messaging and and video chat. So they're using technology, and Japan is fantastic on the technology front, of course. So, you know, they're leveraging their t t technology. And this is one of the things that's interesting as we move forward into, you may have heard the terminology, the future of work and the internet yes. of all things. And it, actually, this is something that can really play to the advantage of people with disability. Because we're having this call, you know, I don't actually know whether Antonia is in a wheelchair. I have no idea, right? So. It's, it can create um, a, a, a level playing field where people can communicate across different distances. They can do their work remotely, but they stay in touch. I mean, that's something that's really accelerated in the past, I don't know, 10 years and will get more so going forward. So what are the jobs of the future? How dependent are they on physical location? Um, and I think that's the direction that we need to take the dialogue, which is what are the jobs of the future and how do people with different types of disability equip themselves with the relevant skills that are going to be required more in the future than perhaps in the past. Um, and with us entering the fourth industrial revolution, you know, the opportunities could be bigger. Of, you know, uh, and so this is this is something where we can change again the way in which the conversation happens about what people can't do as, and, and more about what people can. So um, I think leveraging technology is, is, a, is a fantastic way. Japan's a good example of that. But we have, you know, lots of training programs in our other countries. Okay. And Tony, do you have a question? You're on mute. Uh, go, going back to the going back to the future of work and and working remotely, we know that this is a, an area that some organizations are still struggling to implement because you know, oh, I don't see my I don't see people in the office. I don't know if they are actually working. So, uh, but uh, somehow it seems uh, inevitable to happen. So, what type of uh, 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 advices would we were able to provide us in terms of managing a, a remote workforce. W what have you learned o o on the process, and what are any ideas that you can leave us here in order to for people to be more comfortable with this way of uh, activity? Yeah, I, actually, there's a couple of interesting challenges that um, that people sometimes forget, which is that most of, most of us are, are are relatively social people. And remote working can be quite lonely. Um, so, um, so that's one. Um, having a sense of team and interaction can be important to people's sense of well-being. Um, but the remote working and the communications, time zone can be a challenge. So depending on what time zone you're working, who your colleagues are that you're working with, sometimes you're at the end of your day and the beginning of someone else's day. So that can that can lead to interesting just normal communications challenges which is i'm tired and you're not um uh i'm sort of fractious because i'm tired you know and 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 you're raring to go so the whole idea of problem solving remotely over over geographic and time zone differences is interesting the fact that sometimes that you you know in terms of are you working or not working well, people know whether you're online or not. 
So if someone was a bit worried that actually you're going out and having a lot of beer instead of doing what you're supposed to do, then they can really easily check how frequently you're online if they really, if there is that issue. But actually most remote working relies on trust. It relies on building a relationship, be it remote or in person in terms of delivery. So what is it that I am there to do remotely? What, how am I measured? What are my key performance indicators? How am I communicating what I'm doing with whoever I'm working with? Um, and making sure that it's clear that you're hitting your deliverables irrespective of where you happen to be. Um, and I think that's the key, the communication key to remote working is being very clear and transparent about what it is that you're there to do. And, you know, I'm a mother of three and I travel internationally and, um, you know, and I've FaceTimed into parent conferences and, you know, do, done all that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I, I think in the end, you, you, you have to say sometimes it can be the opposite, which is you, you're never off. You know, you can be on a call at 10 o'clock at night or, you know, five o'clock in the morning. So I think there's there's a problem with technology in that sometimes it's hard to manage a normal day. But for me, it's an advantage because I can then once my children are in bed, I can actually get on and do some more work later um, and still manage to have dinner with them every now and then. So so I think that whole idea of remote working can play to flexibility. It can play to how people can work more effectively and differently and still deliver results. Okay. I, I, I was no, smiling no, because... No. Just, yes. because just, just a few days ago, there was a, a video that went viral all over the web with a journalist from the BBC that was being... Uh, 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 he was conducting an interview with, some, with an expert uh, uh, and that person was on a Skype call, if I'm not mistaken, and suddenly get all the kids coming on his back so that's the no and neil neil was showing showing us his dog so there's also also a human side that can also be a a, a very interesting generator of empathy within the, the different people who are part of this you know remote community and a new more remote workplace yeah. I, w I was smiling because i'm having to bribe my dog with <laughs> treats right now to keep him <laughs> quiet <laughs> so so um, I think we, we, we've pretty much reached the end of our half an hour. It's been fantastic chatting with you. I'm really looking forward to the Twitter chat tomorrow night. I so, hope they go easy on me. <laughs> oh, no, no, we'll, we'll be fine. And you'll be thank fine, you. I'm sure. Thank well, you very much. Thank you to um, to all three of you and uh, appreciate the, um, the opportunity for us to share our thoughts. And and hopefully make more people aware of, of, yeah. of what we what's possible. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.